Hey everyone, what's up? What's going on? Uh, it's Joe this week. Mike had you guys last week. It's my weekend with the kids. Um, <laughs> you can probably definitely tell that I'm feeling a bit under the weather. Uh, hopefully I can recover before next weekend when we record the next three episodes so you guys don't have to endure uh, probably almost like an entire month of me sounding like this, super congested. Uh, but yeah, let's get right into the episode right after I tell you about our Facebook group. How many fingers am I holding up? The Facebook group, um, it's an online forum for movie enthusiasts just like you to discuss movie news, uh, movie trailers, and of course, movie memes. Um, also, how many fingers podcast.bigcartel.com is where you can find all of our merch. Uh, we've got t shirts, stickers, koozies, and all three in a package deal for only $11.99. Uh, for all other links, you can check out our website, how many fingers podcast.com. I can't believe I made. <coughs> oh, I was about to say, I can't believe I made it through that without coughing. But uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, here's our review of Black Klansmen with photographer Jordan Weinrich. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Joe. And you're listening to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up, the podcast. And this week, we're reviewing Black Klansmen. It's close enough. Welcome to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up, featuring two guys getting BXR'd and reviewing movies in a weekly podcast form. <laughs> BXR is a Halo combo, of course, from the Halo video game series. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> this isn't the third time we've done this intro. Uh, thank you, Kevin Hoops, for derailing this episode before it even started. <laughs> with our confusion over this term. Uh, if you have any further synonym suggestions, you can suggest those on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, email, Gmail, Tumblr. Basically, anywhere you can find us, you can reach us, get in touch with us, let us know. But let us delay no further. Betwixt us for the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh time on this podcast. Hell yeah. Woo! Oh, what was the phrase? Uh, oh, your fingers are showing? No. <laughs> Jordan's <laughs> phrase. Oh, I'm back. back. Yeah. Jordan Weinrich. <laughs> That's a callback that to once, Crazy Rich Asians <laughs> episode. <laughs> well, no, Jordan's phrase is from five episodes Swiss ago. Swiss Army Man, I think. Maybe Baby Driver. I have no clue. I don't know. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, he's been on a bunch of these. Jordan is a fantastic photographer, and you can find his work at jordanweinrich.com redtorchvisuals.com I think Jordan Weinrich redirects there because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's usually what I go to it should um, I hope it does Yeah, let me know if it doesn't Find that's what, him at that's what I'm do. paying for <laughs> yep. if it doesn't I have to call someone about that go daddy better be doing their fucking job <laughs> it's really just a copy and paste kind of thing ah <laughs> uh, boy but we're drinking we are drinking Staring at the Sun, Belgian-style wheat. I thought it was like a cool kind of label. Uh, let me you see. You can see there, the, this character has got sunglasses on, and they've, they've lifted them up to stare, stare at, at the, the sun. sun. See the light, brewed with a bitter and sweet orange peel, lemon peel, coriander, and grains of paradise. Mm. Where do I purchase those? Uh, it's our take on a classic light body Belgian wheat ale. Uh, and that's about it. <laughs> it's a Baltimore brewing establishment. Yeah, what brewery is this? A weird crank. It was hard to open, too. Minus a point. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Oh, Oliver Brewing Company. I just saw it on Mike's can. Okay. 
it's uh I don't know. I'm never like fond of like that kind of weird. This is kind of like the, the the mango one that you guys are also drinking right now, but we had this during one? the the Crazy Rich Asians episode um, from two weeks ago with are Ross you Wiseman. Say this tastes like grass. It's got a planty like side to it. Like, Mike, I think your taste buds are just <laughs> your, taste, <laughs> your taste bud wires are crossed or something. <laughs> I swallowed a pound of grass last month on an unrelated note, and this tastes like grass. <laughs> it's like in that Mad Men no, episode I where I, he I like... kind of taste it. Right, there's something that's like not grainy, but like planty yeah. about it, like like fibery or yeah. something. I get it. It's like vegetable beer. <laughs> kind of this beer is brewed with kale. I don't. Sure. I don't not like it. I don't, I'm not crazy it's, it's about got, it. It's honestly. got the right amount of hops for me. It's it, yeah, it's for that kind of flavor. I yeah. like it more than I like the mango one, it's where it a, was like sweet mixed with that planty. You talking flavor. about this mango one's awesome. Yeah, the, I not, really like the mango one. This I don't, this is a little more like uh, Heineken skunky for me. Mm-hmm. It's not bad. I'm not I'm not a huge fan. Um, they can sponsor us either way. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, hey I don't like your company. beer. Sponsor us. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So we're reviewing Black Klansman this week. Joe, you want to give me the IMDb description? I'll give you my mic notes. All right. We'll do a little trade. You know, one for one. I uh, agree to this uh, <laughs> proposal. Uh, Ron Stallworth and an African-American police officer from Colorado successfully manages to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan, uh, with the help of a white surrogate, who eventually becomes head of the local branch. No, he doesn't. Yeah, that's not true. That's objectively not true about mm-hmm. this movie. <laughs> oh, Much like this, the plot of this movie. And because Much of that, like I don't accept this, this trade, and I'm not going to give you my <laughs> <laughs> um, episode over. <laughs> yes, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, going to see what happens uh, off mic. Uh, Black Klansman was based on the 2014 memoir, Black Klansman. With, uh, we should say that Black Klansman is uh, stylized with black, capital K at the end of black, lowercase k, capital K at the beginning of Klansman, and no spaces in between. Spike Lee has successfully made his movie title look like a AIM screen name. <laughs> Yeah, like it kind of feels like, like an Xbox gamer like, tag. Yeah, uh-huh. like did the XPR whatever. BXR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks Black Klansman is BXR somebody wearing white supremacists. <laughs> you just got BXR'd by Black Klansman. <laughs> <C-c-c-> <laughs> yeah, but the 2014 memoir Black Klansman by Ron Stallworth just just two words properly capitalized and proper spaces between i feel like that's such a cleaner and nicer like it was already a great title to mm-hmm. the book I, spike lee had to do his thing to it um speaking of uh the, this was of course directed by spike lee he's got a filmography too many to list all of them but most notably do the right thing uh inside man 25th hour malcolm x she's gotta have it he got game and chirac um was written by Charlie Wachtel, David Rabinowitz, Kevin Wilmot, and Spike Lee. Uh, Wachtel and Rabinowitz are a filmmaking team of sorts. They've done a bunch of short films, and each of them has sort of taken turns writing, directing, or producing all those short films. Um, Wilmot has got a long list. Um, a lot of them seem insignificant. I haven't heard of most of them, but the, the most significant were uh, CSA, the Confederate States of America from 2004, I think it was. And he also wrote Spike Lee's Chirac. Uh, and he directed as well the CSA movie. Um, and that's about all I got for, for Mike Notes. I listened to the Director's Cut podcast episode mm-hmm. uh, for this movie, hoping to get some insight into the behind the scenes of making this movie. And it was just kind of Spike Lee bashing Donald Trump for like an hour. <laughs> or as he refers to him, Agent Orange. <laughs> Um, the only real sort of bit of insight he had was that uh, he knew that he wanted John David Washington for the lead role, and he got the role without auditioning. He also knew John oh, David Washington since he was born. 
from his connection to uh, Denzel Washington and their family. Right. I think his, this is like one of, I was just talking to Degler about this earlier when I'm, he was asking about the film and he was like, I don't think I've ever seen a film with, um, what's it called? John David Washington. Yeah. John David Washington. Ballers. In it. Yeah. And it was, I was just kind of like, well, his, I, I think like his only other like IMDb credit for like movies. I think he's in like four movies this year, but the other three seem like lesser. But um, he was like a like his last credit was like he was like a student or something like extra something in um, Malcolm X. He's a little kid, Malcolm. He did right. talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So it's. I mean, I know he played like college ball, and then he was like in NFL for like uh, a short stint. No, I'm not sure about that. Um. I don't you may know. be right. I just haven't. Yeah, it was just it. something I was reading on Wikipedia. I don't know if he actually played or anything. Mm -hmm. it, it might have just been cool to have Denzel Washington's <laughs> son on your NFL team or something. Kind of like, random. What a cool luxury. He has yeah. a producer credit for uh, Book of Eli. John David Washington? Yeah. Oh, huh. That's cool. He's a co producer for that. Um, but yeah, uh, he, yeah, he has been on Ballers for however long that's been out now. And he's actually like my favorite character and i don't know whether it's because he's good or he's just a handsome charismatic dude mm -hmm. um which again he kind of does the same thing in this film i think he's he's fun to watch and i it's a decent like debut pretty much you know to the big screen uh i don't know i, I don't have much else to say about like his performance besides he's he's fun to watch you know yeah like, like he's it. convincing mm -hmm. um yeah. i don't think he was necessarily stand out but i think right. he, like he's you he would completely believe yeah I, yeah i i'm like also not complaining about him being like the leading man i'm oh, just yeah. kind of like yeah it works. I think I read too many reviews that were like, oh, he like reminds me of like young Denzel. And I'm like, maybe the way he looks, but I don't, I don't I completely think, I don't, disassociate. I don't that think he I fully this, has yeah. the range that Denzel oh, he definitely has always right. kind of had, you know? Um, he didn't even really like, like I was expecting him to like sound like, you know, like a, a Denzel like stereotype based on these reviews. And I didn't really get that. He um, has some Denzel sound to him. Obviously, I think there's some there's something where you listen to him and you you can kind of believe it. I think a lot of his like facial expressions were like that as well. That, that you can you can kind of be he like, needs okay, to learn how I to can pro hear it. Project. He's got a quiet voice. He does. For this movie. Um, I don't know. It also like, like I think of Denzel and I think of that like oh, like that like big booming mm -hmm. voice, and he's just got this sort of meek, uh, timid, quiet voice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that might be kind of befitting of the character as someone he was trying to not stand out as much yeah. in a way. You know, when he's in the police station, he's trying to not, you know, push people's buttons and get on their bad side, at least to start. I, yeah. So and maybe it was a like an actual choice that he did. I, yeah. Like that. I, I don't want to fault him too much, but there's a lot about his character I'm like not crazy about that I'll get into mm -hmm. kind of later. But let's talk about the fucking. Uh, I I hate the opening scene of this movie with the Alec Gone with the Wind. <clears throat> oh, Alec after the Gone with the Wind scene. Wait, what is the uh, Gone with the Wind? Scene? The, the beginning the scene, big the crane big crane shot with that's all like, the dead oh, bodies. Yes. So he's like looking yeah, yeah, for yeah, doctor. Yeah. It's like morning. Yeah, that was I. That I couldn't <laughs> place that in this. I like had such a hard time placing that in this movie. That there's all right. I mean, so what not, the not, fuck? Yeah, what to, the not, fuck did that really even? Not to show our fingers, as was the phrase <laughs> yes. coined by Ross <laughs> yes. Wiseman uh -huh. two episodes ago in our Crazy Rich Asians review. But there's a lot about the editing of this movie that kind of feels like a like college PowerPoint yeah. presentation mm -hmm. rather than a movie. Like I, there's something that's that's missing there, and like it's kind of all over the place, and. Like, I, I know that Spike Lee has his reasons for inserting all of that, but I feel like he didn't go to the effort of, like, okay, but how do I make it make sense to the viewer? Right. In terms of the narrative of the story. So, like, I understand why Gone with the Wind is inserted here mm -hmm. because he also wants to insert, he has references and actual clips from uh, Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to make this point about, like, you know, uh, 
the way that like uh, African Americans have been portrayed in films, and you know how like we have these two movies that are like he talks about it on the podcast are on like the AFI like 100 list of like best movies, but like Gone with the Wind is like you know like Confederates like you know sort of like refusing to like accept the end of the Civil War, and like mm-hmm. that's kind of a racist concept. And then like obviously the Birth of a Nation is a very uh, racist movie like responsible for the rise of the the Ku Klux Klan again yeah this movie is kind of like a uh, Spike Lee vision board that's kind of been like translated yeah. <laughs> into a movie where it's kind of like yeah they all kind of have the same theme but I don't see how it all fits in here Spike you know like mm-hmm. yeah no this might have been like a revelation you had recently like but... I, I don't know if it's like leaking in from like because he's I, I didn't list a, a lot of them um in my mic notes but like spike lee's been doing a lot of documentaries as well over right. his career and like mm-hmm. these seem like clips that like maybe might work better if you were going to do a documentary about ron stallworth and you know especially if you want to talk about like the, the ku klux klan and like set up like their sort of revival and like this mindset that they're coming from of like the confederacy and sort of refusing to lose like then that that clip of gone with the wind makes a little bit more se- i mean it makes sense but it just doesn't blend and fit in terms of a smooth like narrative flow well it's the same movie. thing with the last five minutes of the movie yeah too. that's really hard to yeah yeah i mean we'll get to that we'll <laughs> yeah, try to say yeah. that to the end <laughs> that's like arguably but, it, it, but starting at the beginning you, the worst you have that. You, yeah. you start on this this scene from gone with the wind which i haven't seen in so long i'm assuming is from the climax of the movie it's, it's or like, the end of the movie it, it, yeah, again, like like you you're saying, it's like so far out of this movie and then we get a little closer to this movie and then we're finally in this movie. It's just it's almost alienating mm-hmm. to like watch this movie. But yeah, like thank you for for pointing that out cuz I completely forgot. I was about to say like, man, the opening of this scene with like Alec Baldwin doing like an old KKK propaganda movie with like weird outtakes and like plastered down hair and glasses like i was i was like that's a weird opening but like See, i liked, that's i liked that weird. in a vacuum like i was laughing yes, yeah, yeah. at that mm-hmm. scene and it's like nervous laughter mixed with like actual laughter like alec baldwin's giving a, an objectively great comedic performance in terms of like it, it, almost, it reminds me of like do you remember that video of like the the cursing <laughs> rv salesman it was like i don't know e-bombs world era like mm-hmm. uh online videos it's basically like a guy like trying to film an rv commercial for like rv sales but he keeps fucking everything up and Mm -hmm. it's kind of similar to like the bill o'reilly like we'll fucking do it live type thing he's just cursing all the time alec baldwin reminds me a lot of like that video like Mm -hmm. he's just he's he's fucking up and he keeps being like Like, just like making these noises to like clear the air before he does like the next take but like the lighting of it is like really sinister like he's got like either like a red light bouncing on him or he's got like the projection playing or both sometimes and it's like ominous and like cool and it's like showing like sort of this like dark underbelly of like you know kkk propaganda and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but then they don't tie it into the movie besides obviously the the thematic element of the kkk and like it doesn't take a lot to get into this movie besides having like to do with Alec the KKK. Have Alec Baldwin yeah. be a character yeah. later in this movie yeah. or something. Or I mean, I can, as you're talking about it, I'm thinking about it. And you know how like a lot of movies have just like a opening credit world building scene? Like Star Wars has a scroll right. and everyone has that. Maybe this was his attempt at something like that. To build it would have almost worked better if he just did this and not the Gone with the Wind. Yeah. But it's like, yeah. like Joe's saying, it's like... Here's like the world at large. Here's mm-hmm. a very specific part of the result of you know a, a world that's been viewing cinema yeah. that promotes the Confederacy for a hundred right. years. Again, it's and like a, it's like a collage world. where it's kind of like you didn't like that picture, like maybe this one and this uh-huh. one and yeah, oh, it was okay, a very... I'll start the movie now. Like, and there know, are different like, like aspect ratios too, yeah, which uh-huh. is a nitpicky thing. But like when you don't agree with the, the complete reason for inserting them, then you kind of start to be like, all right, was it worth like that jarring? juxtaposition of aspect ratio and when you're like a movie audience see i can you're like trying that. to you're trying to bring you're trying to introduce somebody to a movie and you're fucking all over the place that's like not a good start yeah I, like I, I i don't know like if it all worked out kind of at the end maybe it's, maybe it's a little more forgiving but i think like when you're all fucking over the place and you're kind of like what was that about at the beginning or like what was that about at the end or you know i don't know it's it's well, a little it's like, more I mean, like like uh, this is sort of a, a stretch of an example okay uh, they're not really thematically similar at all but like i think of like tree of life where it takes that weird like random 
sort of uh, segue to be like, hey, let's look at like dinosaurs for a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's like it's it's a consistent vibe and theme and mm-hmm. ambience. Like it's it fits within the sort of like speed and pace of the movie as well as the look and feel of the movie. Mm-hmm. And even though it's like you know in terms of content, it's very very different from the rest of the movie. Like there's just we're just looking at at a uh, dinosaurs, you know, evolving and coming onto their own two feet like it's one of those things where like you can kind of sit on it and think of it and be like okay yeah like they're, they're trying to get across this idea of like life being precious and you know a whole bunch of other theories that you could make about tree of life um but that also happens like in like the middle of the movie so you get to like get into the movie and know what it's about and then that happens and then the movie goes on whereas this is like yeah it it, I, I keep going back to it feels like a college PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> like especially with the different aspect ratios and stuff right. going on. Like it's just jarring, jarring. All right, now we'll let you get into the movie for a little bit. And then it kind of it, it sits on the movie for a while. And then we have that one scene to jump around a little bit later on in the movie where they're like walking on the bridge which is like a nice scene, but then he keeps like just overlaying the posters of the movies they're talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah. On top, yeah. and that's that looks like it takes you out. college yeah. video editing. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it it it's not a nice look to have like just like these picture. It, it looks like a like a YouTube meme video or something. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's not a great presentation for that, and it's not uh, that part really bugged me because I felt like that wasn't really necessary at all to see the posters. Yeah. Like, it's just a nice scene to have them talking about, you know, movies that are representing African Americans at the time and like having a discussion about black exploitation and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't need to see the posters for it. Right. I'm trying to find a way to word it because I did enjoy it, but I'm trying to figure out about why. I mean, one of the things is I've been kind of thinking about mixed mediums and stuff. Like when you talk about the different aspect ratios in the beginning, I kind of like that personally mm-hmm. i like that i think it's mostly projects. just kind of aesthetically mm-hmm. and then same with the posters like it's kind of uh it's kind of feels like old school editing in a way which i kind of like to see sometimes after mm-hmm. like a whole giant stretch of extremely well precision editing cinematics it's kind of nice sometimes to see these kind of like mishmash of random stuff i mean it's just kind of a personal thing which i Mm -hmm. kind of enjoyed i can definitely see why it's jarring Mm -hmm. and it did it did take me back to being like hey watch the editing it took me out of the movie for sure Mm -hmm. so i agree with that but it i still enjoyed it as being like hey this is kind of fun seeing like the original poster for yeah i I think i would have liked more to be able to stay in that scene and be like what does this mean for these two characters to be having this conversation and not what spike on this bridge yeah because it takes you out of the personal thing to the here's kind of a small history of like black cinema yeah and like i I feel like i could have gotten at least some of that from the conversation of like picking up on the titles i didn't need to see the yeah he made it very obvious Yeah. yeah But from the like kind of Alec Baldwin intro, we cut to a card or a text overlay that says disjoint based on some for real for real shit. Uh, which is like I like that. I'm it's, fine. It's I'm fine with that. It's, it's, I like it well, too. He calls it's, it's a Spike Lee joint. Oh no no no! So. Of, of course, it's a Spike Lee flourish, and I like that. But then like also the poster says like based on a crazy outrageous incredible true story. But. If you look into the okay, his- we're getting into this. If you look into the history, I mean, if you read like again, like the kind of Boots Riley letter or whatever, and you look into the history of like what actually happened in real life, none of this actually happened, and it's a little weird. The movie, or is the the memoir that uh, Ron Stallworth wrote false as well? Um, I'm I'm actually not <laughs> familiar with what was written within the memoir, but. Um, history will tell you um, almost none of this happened besides like him talking on the phone hmm. you know um, which I mean I could get into like spoilerish stuff so there was no white surrogate no there, no, there, there, was. there was a white surrogate but like um, you know the I'll, I'll just get into <clears throat> it the, you know yeah. Ad, Adam's driver's character like Jewish heritage is fictional um, like, you know, like the whole lie detector and smash window bit is uh, just, you know, fictional, written on script. Um, you know, uh, near the end, the kind of like XCON recognizing him is fictional. 
Um, the love interest uh, didn't exist. She's just kind of like uh, fabricated or just invented well, no, by Spike didn't Lee. Didn't she exist, but wasn't it like... Um, I actually have this open. I'm just trying to find exactly where it was. But wasn't it that like... <sighs> And go on, let me find okay. it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go on, but I'll come back to you. Um, the entire terrorist uh, attack plotline is completely fictional. Uh, there's no record of any planning or any sort of like uh, any bomb attacks ever in Colorado Springs, and uh, just a little small one, like the the John David Washington's character never actually like revealed himself to like David Duke hmm. and like a bunch of other stuff where it's just kind of like man dude what was the point of telling this story which like Boots Riley was and oh like when you get deep into that Boots Riley letter like it starts to get bad too mm-hmm. this guy like the so Boots Riley is the director of uh sorry to bother yeah you. sorry to bother you uh I mean like and what was the band he was in before that I forget. I don't know. They they score. Sorry to bother you, but basically, Ron Stallworth. Uh, I'll get more into detail in it later. Uh, he was kind of actually this black guy, uh, the lead vocalist of the Coup and Street Sweeper Social Club. Right, but Ron Stallworth kind of was this guy that they used to infiltrate, like these, like you know, like like the meeting that he did at the beginning. And they would use that to militarize the Ku Klux Klan to kill, uh, like, black revolutionary characters and everything. Sorry, so, I wasn't listening. Did you also get to the point where they did that, but then when the he, they inf- uh, infiltrated, like, the Black Panther Party, they tried to shut that down? Mm-hmm. So it was yeah. kind of reverse of what this movie was saying. It's basically <clears throat> Ron Stallworth was, you know, like an African-American that they corrupted into killing, like, people of i don't know like the revolution of i don't know it was just i don't know it's it's weird i I missed the first part of that because i was looking at this wikipedia thing go for it who was using ron stallworth the Uh, cops or the the police department uh was was using him to infiltrate the wasn't it the fbi what was that project called was using him to like yeah, infiltrate yeah like like you know like the meeting at the beginning where he goes to see what's his name speak or whatever mm-hmm. he was using him to infiltrate that to kind of point out like the big bads and then militarize the Ku Klux Klan to attack and kill them and then also just you know people he the police was militarizing the Ku Klux Klan yes, you're yeah, so yes. Ron Starworth was getting information yeah mm-hmm. about who is a target and right. giving it to the Ku- the police was giving it to the Ku Klux Klan right yes okay all right and yeah. uh, just. A whole bunch of other not great stuff. And then when they infiltrated grew organizations like the Black Panther Party and the other camera just went out again, mm-hmm. um, they would try to use that information to shut that down instead of militarizing like they did the Ku Klux Klan. So it was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they... they it's went, a lot of... They went in slightly <clears throat> into that where it mm-hmm. was like, I thought there was going to be more of it in the movie because the first thing he does is infiltrate the... Um, the Black Panther Party sort of uh, meeting, or the I forget what the college group is called, but the guy is from the Black Panther Party, I believe. The oh, I can't remember the Conway Churi. Yeah, yeah, yes, you're right. Um, and I thought they were I mean, gonna. I, have, can, I can't pronounce it. Like I thought there was gonna be more of that where they were like, I thought it was gonna be like, oh yeah, you can you can keep doing the Ku Klux Klan stuff, but we also still need you to keep infiltrating like the whatever and i thought there was going to be more of like a a moral decision he had to make right and it's and it's not that they don't i don't think they show the black panther party i think they show like the like like national like civil rights leader i think he is mm-hmm. i don't think there's yeah, like he was, he was a former black about panther yeah, right, party yeah. member yeah it's yeah, so <clears throat> black panther at some point and the way they so, portrayed him according to that letter we were reading before is also mm-hmm. different yeah and it's i don't it's just it's weird because this is um, geez, I, I didn't mean to bring this up this early, but it's just strange that this is kind of like a bad movie by like the plot points kind of, in my opinion. This is a mov- bad movie where I'm like, why are they like kind of doing it like this? And then like you look into the story and you're like, oh, all of these events are all fictional. 
it's just it's so weird it's kind of like what it's it's like maybe spike lee liked like the tagline of kind of being like what if like a black guy infiltrated the kkk and like Mm. that's kind of like the extent that he like looked into it and it was just kind of i don't know it's i yeah or maybe it was just trying to like make him be portrayed in a different light than he yeah, has definitely. been right and i'm sure like david duke probably thinks like very highly of himself mm-hmm. for like kind of like i infiltrated the kkk you know like but again like he doesn't actually do any of this stuff yeah. like that 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 happened in this movie david duke or ron stallworth he meant ron stallworth, ron stallworth. <laughs> i'm sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> david duke is an duke's operative <laughs> inside the kkk <laughs> david duke's probably real it's a long <laughs> con he's probably he's real deep in that underground. <laughs> he's probably real proud of himself isn't he <laughs> um but yeah it's it's weird but the, let's let's get back into that and just also this movie like these events happened in like, like it's like once you start researching like the events of this movie like the fucking like web starts to become like real untangled and like crazy like even as something as little as like these events like took place in like 1978 to 1979 but like this film has like the aesthetic and clothing and style of like early 70s yeah. like borderline 60s like early 70s kind of like even the racial tension kind of is like in that place Mm -hmm. uh it's it's just like really weird uh i also fucking hate the the monologues and speeches in this movie they just like some of that editing is so bad like Uh, from who um i think when they go to see the first uh the first speaker um at oh, the actual speech speech yeah all yeah the speech speech at the beginning there's one at the end there's like a few smaller like monologues like sprinkled around the middle kind of i just i don't i that is a spikely flourish and like i just i don't know I'm, i like that at the end though the that last speech when it was yeah, that one was like speeches that, that cross cutting mm-hmm. was good i like in that, that one a lot. um the first one I can definitely just, see it. After a while, they take me out of it. It's well, just like fir- the first so one was way too long, long. Yeah. yeah, and they kept going back to the same technique of like shooting these individual audience faces in like isolation. Yeah, mm-hmm. and having them like fading in and out at different speeds and distances and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And like it was cool at first because it was like, all right, I get the point. Like these people are captivated; they're mm-hmm. definitely feeling right. it. And our main character is paying attention to them to so he can report back on what they're feeling but then it just kept going because they wanted that speech to keep going <laughs> right yeah uh just just also to kind of start from the beginning like the what is his name ron stallworth yeah. like the ron stallworth character is like integrating into like the colorado springs police department which is like incredibly it's like it's loaded it's like a very loaded thing i thought that was some of the most captivating parts of the movie oh yeah same well he's like well here's my opinion is that he's like this first black police officer or just being a black police officer is a loaded concept in 2018 you know Mm -hmm. although Um, I, i did objectively hate clay davis same same wait wait hold hold on hold on a minute i'll right, we'll get to that <laughs> we oh we i i just like i feel like maybe you guys can clue me in on something but i i feel like we never really like find out why he joins the police service like we have a shot of him looking at a sign that says like join the police service and then like all of a sudden it cuts to him in like an interview he says um, it at one point near the end of the movie where he's like i've always wanted to be a police yeah. officer yeah. Oh, okay. And then that's okay. it. That's it. There's may, no backstory of and maybe why. There, there's some sort of, yeah, like movie kind of thing. Like like the scene you were discussing, like the, the whole movie. Maybe he's captivated by like these kind of like spy movies kind of and everything. Um, but yeah, he joins the police department. We never have any like uh, kind of scenes of any sort of pushback from like his peers mm-hmm. uh, besides uh, like Laura Harrier's character. Um but also because he has no peers, he has no like parents, he has no like any details about his life outside of like the well, police. Well, I mean, it, it does mainly come from her, but I think it gets the point across because mm-hmm. like all of her conversations with her, she keeps using terms like pigs and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and he's like, "Why do you use terms like that?" And but that's like a girl he just met. Like, I don't think like I I don't know. Like he's he's I, still he's still picks, yeah. But I, like, I think his, she she is supposed to represent right. sort of the the black community to him in terms of like 
they're trying to push for this that the black liberation movement they right. keep talking about and pushing things forward and he obviously feels that but part of him is also just like yeah i kind of just want to be a cop like i wanted to do this since i was a kid and i just i, I think she is supposed to represent it may not be the most effective right. but they are trying to get that across through her i just have like no idea what ron stallworth's life is like outside of yeah, I mean, outside of kind of seeing a sign and says join the police department, and him going like okay and strolling over the police take department. A, if you take away like the interesting and then he sort of he's almost story like an, of this uh-huh. movie, like there's not really any character to Ron Stallworth. No, no, he's just he just he's just a cop who's it becomes a day in the life kind of thing without mm-hmm. an actual life kind of. Mm-hmm. Right, but then <laughs> it's it's kind of like he's offended by like racism within like the police station, and it's just kind of like. Do you do you live in this world? Kind and the of? thing like, is, it's, like, it's they don't, weird. They also they don't do a great job of like all the police are like sweethearts. Too. Yeah, as well, well, there's, like, there's like yeah. different, one there's different cop. shades. That, well, there's the one bad cop, and then I think the chief is like at least middling about it. Like, I, well, he, he, never, he, he makes, never says anything <clears throat> offensive or anything. He makes, no, but he's um, more. Com- he has like, the he has way he speaks. He has right, different yeah. priorities. He's got focuses on other areas rather than mm-hmm. you know racial equality and stuff like that but then like everyone in the like uh what is the department that he en- ends up joining the what is it the intelligence intelligence mm-hmm. um department like they all immediately take to him and like him and there's no kind of like hazing even though he's joining a new department yeah it's also kind of like when he's working like the file department or or whatever that department is it like he goes like he like spends like one day there and he's like i could be doing so much more kind of and it's like it doesn't matter like what your race is at that point it's yeah it's like, like you're you gotta still work a the rookie rights, kind dude. of yeah. like it was just it's such <clears throat> the details of the story are so weird i like could it never seems like i mean i'll give the memoir the benefit of the doubt and assume mm-hmm. that it goes into more detail about a lot of this stuff like i'm sure it right. wasn't like just two days in the the files department i sure didn't oh like, right yeah, immediately yeah. jump into that stuff mm-hmm. i'm sure the, on the first day he didn't see a, a, an ad for the ku klux klan in the newspaper yeah. and call it and start this whole story underway mm-hmm. um but that is how it plays in the movie it's yeah that, i mean that was like something yeah. what i thought was weird it's just you know you see an ad and somehow you just get departmental approval to start an investigation i don't know I well, just, he didn't I, even get approval he started it and they were well like, that's true yeah he started it. it's also sure like <laughs> Like, I'm sure, like, it wasn't just one racist cop in his department. I'm sure it was, like... In, like, most of it yeah. in real life. But it was yeah, just yeah, kind of, like... I mean, they it's cleaner to, to just have one. Put it into, like, one character, but everyone else is, like, fine. Um, I don't it know. It is... There's... I have similar feelings about this movie as I did with the movie, like, Detroit. Um, where it's, like... It they, reminded me a lot of that. They yeah. take... Like, it's, it's, it's approaching this, like, big... Heady's not the word, but a big, like, important social topic. Mm-hmm. And in its effort to make it, like, a palatable movie, it ends up sort of treating the, the topic poorly. Because, like, it, it, it takes racist and racism, which, like, doesn't need to be, like, murderous to be fucking ugly. You know? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. racism is ugly in all of its forms. Right. Mm-hmm. But, like, this movie, like, has the scene that, like, I hated where it's, like, the, the one Felix <clears throat> character and his wife, like, in bed and there's, like happy music playing on the radio and she's like oh i'm so glad that we get to like murder n-words together like after all this time i've always so dreamed weird. of like doing yeah. this and it's like it, it, it's like i'm trying to think of how to word this exactly like it, it, it's because racists racists and nazis don't deserve you know the benefit of the yes. doubt or fair treatment on screen mm-hmm. but you, i feel like you do have to have a little bit more imagination in terms of like i don't assume that all nazis go to bed and they're like oh i can't wait until i can just murder me some n-words like mm-hmm. yeah racism is more complicated than that and there's there's more to it than that and i think that's the tougher like conversation to have is that mm-hmm. like you know it, it's maybe not necessarily about like this bloodthirsty hatred of other races as it is about this like insecurity and like Mm-hmm. I don't know that that's more interesting to me and truthful to me than that scene there. So like that you have like that, which was kind of like what Detroit did with like their cops where they were just kind of like, everyone's lesser than us and we're going to like treat you guys like animals and stuff like that right. rather than like being a part of this like system uh-huh. that like fucks things over and not wanting to like sacrifice your place in society, which I think is a more realistic view of racism uh, especially, you know, in the South, especially if you're going to show stuff like Gone with the Wind and 
Birth of a Nation, mm-hmm. like that's the entirety of what Birth of a Nation is about, is like this fear of not wanting to sacrifice your part in society. Um, yeah, so I, I just feel like that's a weird, like almost like too aggressive view to take on racism. And it's a weird thing to say because like, obviously like, the, again, like I don't fucking care. Racists don't deserve, you know, a positive light in film. Mm, but right. I do think that complex topics deserve a honest light to be shed on them and not to just be like, well, I bet they're going to bed every night, like hoping that people are, they can like murder, you know, N words. Well, cause right. it also makes the conversation a little larger when you see like, more examples of racism instead of just bloodthirsty violent Mm -hmm. and this movie pretty much just portrays that so you you start to think being like oh man like workplace discrimination in the police station isn't Mm -hmm. really racism because there's very little of it in this movie kind of so in the end it's like only you know the neo-nazis and Ku Klux Klan that are out to like shoot and hang people deserve this and again like, that's shit. i brought this up with detroit but that was why i thought i liked loving so much is that it was showing like real injustice happening and even real hatred but it wasn't through the lens of like you know i'm ready to like murder every single yep. well it was through like these misguided beliefs and people that thought they were doing the right thing mm-hmm. it wasn't some like murderous fetish it was mm-hmm. like you know he like when he talks to the the joel Edgerton character, uh, whatever loving, I forget what his first name is in that movie. Like he's trying to sort of like let him in on this like idea of like, you know, what you're doing is kind of unnatural and wrong. And like, you know, mm-hmm. if you know, it's good for you, you know, you'll, you'll get out of this relationship and, you know, find a better path. And like, it, it's again, it's like a more complex way to look at racism, but I think it is more truthful when you look at like the world that we do live in now. Right. And it's harder to tell. Like it's it's much easier to, to be like, all right, well, let's have this sort of funny scene where they're we're kind of like flipping, you know, sort of a, a like trope on its head of like you know lovers laying in bed and talking about the big things they want to do, but the big things that the people in the KKK want to do is murder n words, you know. And right. It's and it is. It's it's um it's an unintelligent kind of view of like the human experience yeah it, it's kind of like you can you can't look at the the enemy almost like that you know like if that's what you consider it the enemy like it's like you can't i don't know it's just like that's where shit goes wrong that's like when trump gets elected you know mm. is when kind of like well these guys who got mush for brains like <laughs> oh you're gonna vote for trump and it's like oh wow trump won because you fucking didn't reach out to these people and yeah. you fucking criticize them like it's just like I, I mean I again know. it's not, just not yeah. that Nazis and racists deserve reaching out to oh, but but you you have to understand the path that led them to this hatred kind yeah, of yeah. you know it, it's just you can't put them in a different class of like human you have to be like all right these are all humans something went terribly wrong here mm-hmm. and this guy's psyche is very fucked up where he thinks you know this is a like a reasonable way of life you know i i I don't know and it's and it's under i don't know it it was also kind of like this movie was advertised kind of in a way where i kind of thought it was going to be like inglorious bastards but for like you know the ku klux klan kind of Mm -hmm. like i got i kind of got that kind of vibe and it is like a little bit like that but so you thought this was like django and chain 2 right yeah yeah i guess i guess so Chain but not, chain not modern totally. times. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's weird. It's just, it's kind of like Jordan and I were talking about, like, the David Duke's character. Like, the David Duke character is kind of, like, it's too close to, like, you know, we need, like, good white folk like you to make America great again you know Uh, i I was just like oh my god i do i do like (laughs) the portrayal of the david duke character because i think that is closer to what i'm thinking of in terms Mm -hmm. of like everything he stands for is disgusting yeah Um, for sure he is like you know when he like when he says stuff like on there's a lot of their conversations on the phone that like a make america great again conversation aside that are pretty great oh i love the the, the ideas that i'm trying to come from of like you know, it isn't this like bloodthirsty, you know, thing. Like, Especially the one where he's like, you know, we don't hate them. Yes. But we just feel we're superior. Like, yeah. yeah There's that, a lot of is, reinforcement of yeah. that. Yeah. Which is disgusting and ugly on its yeah. own. And it doesn't need to be this like, 
murderous bloodbath of like I, I do uh, yeah, yeah I I don't know I I don't completely especially have... because like in all those instances of like these horrible crimes and atrocities that have happened throughout history like I can't again I'm very open to be correcting if I'm wrong but I think right. most of them have been like tension boiling over and them sort of looking for like an excuse to act out rather than like oh like I'm gonna go on like this like spree of just like bombing places just cause you know like right. it, it was always there was some reason that they were using to justify their hatred yeah it, it's kind of like if you do a school shooting it's not like you don't hate your classmates that much there's something mentally wrong with you mm -hmm. that's a weird example i don't know if i stand by that but it is well, no i see what you're I, saying I, it's it's yeah. not just an abject hatred for everyone right. there's there's something that happened that's causing there's a you reason to feel for that it hatred. yeah you know, it's it's not and i can almost understand where spike lee's coming from where he's trying to show like shades you know like there's kind of like oh wow like the guy in his bed or, or who's like really gunning you, That's you, true. you know, like, there, there like were the, some the really hard ass levels. antagonist. There's David Duke, who's like actually, you know, he's, he's just trying to he, politics. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and, then, and, then, and then there's, there's the, the chapter leader, leader yeah, the who is kind of like in between that. Who is like kind of like this kind I mean, of. It's a gentle... tough thing to talk about because, like, I, I don't fucking care. Like, racists don't deserve a fair portrayal. Right. But I think for being able to have a like proper discussion about these topics a fair portrayal is, is yeah. necessary. Yeah. Right. To look at that, like racism is not always like overt and bloodthirsty mm -hmm. and murderous. It, it can be ugly just in the ways that it manifests in microaggressions and just, you know, ways that you know, like, like, like I look at like get out where like, mm -hmm. even though like, you know, in the like, can't be like B movie part of the movie, it, it did turn out to be like murderous and bloodthirsty you know, some of the parts that like made us cringe were like the guy being like, oh, yeah, like I hope Obama gets like a third term and stuff like that. And, right. you know, sort of microaggressions that can manifest in those ways. Right. Yeah. It's a weird fucking movie. And like, honestly, I was like, oh, this is like easily like we're reviewing The Nun, um, Crazy Rich Asians and Black Klansmen uh, in this batch. And I was like, obviously, far and away, Black Klansman is going to be the best movie here. Mm -hmm. And it was not. Um, the Nun was terrible, but, <laughs> you know, like, uh, it, it, it's just, it's not good. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know about Spike Lee. Like, I love, like, Do the Right Thing. I just, I don't know about, like, a, I haven't watched a lot. Um, and then that... Like, those films that I have watched, like, over the past decade have not been good. Um, there was a ton of pushback with, like, Chirac, like, kind of. Like, I like I just started only paying attention because, like, Chance the Rapper kind of spoke out about it. Where it was kind of like, dude, this film is fucking racist, man. Like, mm -hmm. against... I don't know. He had, like, a lot to say. I definitely uh, encouraged... You know, researching that and researching kind of pushback with uh, Chirac and everything, uh, where it's kind of like I don't know if you're helping the problem we have here, um, where well, it's kind of that's why I'm trying to decide if I want to bring this up or not. Okay, because it's not necessarily related directly to the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever, but like in that same letter that we were mentioning about at the bottom of it, he mentions that Spike Lee got two hundred thousand dollars to. Yes. Um, <clears throat> make advertisements to make police and minority community relations better mm -hmm. while everyone's criticizing him for that. Right. He's on, so that, he's on the NYPD payroll yeah. to help improve relations between police and minorities. And he just took this like very recently yes. or like, bef like right before this film. So I don't know whether that's, Boots Riley speculating, or is yeah, that too like, coincidental? I don't know if well, this I, is, I, I, I think it's sure a fair point. I think, if, I think yeah. if you even if you remove the knowledge that I didn't have before this, Jordan brought this up of him being on the NYPD payroll for however much. Like there was an honest discussion going on on Twitter because um, these movies were sort of out at the same time. Uh, this in limited release, and when Sorry to Bother You was in wide release. Um, sort of comparing the two movies, and I haven't seen Sorry to Bother You yet, but from my understanding, it's this sort of like anti-capitalist, like fuck you to 
like white capitalist America and right. like racism and stuff that's going on in that lens. Whereas this movie is sort of like, you know, it's a fuck you to like the extreme racism of like the, the Ku Klux Klan, but it's like a positive lens for like, you know, police in America. Yes, that's, and it's that's like, it's like a weird time to take like a sympathetic view towards police. And I'm sort of torn on the, the subject because I mean, it's not that the movie doesn't broach that idea because they have discussions with the Laura Harrier character and uh, the Ron Stallworth character where they're discussing, you know, like uh, she says at one point, like I can't sleep with someone who I consider to be like the enemy in like America right now. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of like, you know, well, you know, I've, I've wanted to do this like, since I was a child and like in the beginning of the movie when he's getting hired at the Colorado Springs they're like comparing him to like Jackie Robinson you know right. like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. you're gonna face a lot of racism but like you know someone had to be the first and right, yeah. I don't know it, it, it begs a little bit of discussion of like is it unsympathetic to African Americans to portray police in a positive light at all until problems are fixed or it's it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 that's the that's 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 Oh, man, this movie's like message is like false, which it isn't really. It's well, it's it's tough because again, like we're saying, the the movie, it's a little bullheaded in its message, um, like in the actual fictional part of the movie, and then when you take into consideration the fact that they like misconstrued a lot of these facts to like essentially like make the movie more interesting and to make the racists seem a little bit worse, like the fact that they weren't actually planning a like terrorist like attack Mm -hmm. takes a lot of the heat out of this movie like Mm -hmm. they were just burning crosses in a field takes the like Like, urgency out of this movie and i mean i don't want to like de-escalate like the Ku Klux Klan or whatever, but this specific Let's hear them out. (laughs) like like, this this specific chapter there was or there was like there was never a the event that happened in a movie that's based off some for real for real shit never happened you know like that's it or just like like the poster that's just like you're never gonna you're not gonna believe this crazy fucking story that happens mm-hmm. like it's just like well but that's also like not 90 percent of this didn't happen but it's also not to say that they didn't do really bad shit oh no it's of just course. yeah and, and like, well, again, that's, the thing, that's the point that i'm more right. making is that like you don't right. need to like racism is ugly no matter how you portray it and you don't need to like mm-hmm. turn up the volume on that shit to make it right. come across like we, under- oh, for we sure. understand yeah, that yeah. racism is ugly, mm-hmm. you know, just from like scenes of like a character giving someone like a bad look or like, again, that's why I thought like the police uh, station scenes were some of the more compelling where like the, the cops are coming to John David Washington and using like a, a derogatory term when they're asking about like mm-hmm. uh, perps, like information on them. Um, right. And, you know, like that's there's enough like loaded, you know nature to a situation like that without having to go to like these crazy extremes if you're going to manufacture those if that actually happened absolutely tell the story that way um but if you have to manufacture it to make it that way like i don't know there's enough to the story to examine on its own you know like the movie the movie could have been and again that would have been like a better movie i think for people like boots riley who are complaining about like a you you made stuff up and you're being maybe a little bit too sympathetic to police here like Mm -hmm. if if the movie is about this interesting scenario of infiltrating the ku klux klan which is like it's just crazy that it happened like it's 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 a oh it's it's that concept alone is worth making a movie about right regardless of the stuff that you fictionalize of you know a black guy Mm -hmm. on the phone talking with david duke Mm -hmm. um but then like i mean i think there's enough drama without having to fictionalize stuff in terms of the racism he probably encountered in the police force Mm -hmm. like working there and them especially when you take into consider the fact the real life facts of him being used by the police force to like radicalize the Ku Klux Klan like he thinks right. he's doing you know this thing to bring down the Ku Klux Klan and in reality he's being used sort of against himself like yeah. mm-hmm. 
that's a story right there. Like shine right. a light on how fucked up like America and the police force can be at times. Why does it have to be so sympathetic? I think that's the problem when you start making a film about somebody who's still alive, kind of. Uh, it's just kind of, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's filming. I mean, that wouldn't even necessarily be against Ron oh, Stallworth no, no. Right, but to I, be like, he was trying to do this noble thing, but he was in this fucked up America that we still kind of live in. Right, but Ron Stallworth, I, I can also see Ron Stallworth being like, fuck you, Spike Lee, don't make this movie where it shows me, like, you know. Well, I'm so saying I don't think yeah, it would, right. I don't think it would be showing him in a negative light. It'd be him right, yeah, with no, honest no, intentions course. being used by the system. But still, I think it would show him in some form of an like like people would watch this movie and be like, why don't he say anything? You know, because they can't comprehend living in like the 1970s almost. You know, uh-huh. like it's I can't comprehend living in like 2010 where people would just openly use racial slurs on Twitter. Yeah. You know, like, like shit changes, like, so fast, you know? Like, where it's kind of like, well, let's shine, like, Ron Stallworth in a in a good light, and, you know, where he's never... Nothing is ever compromised or whatever. Um, it just, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm and you salty, just got, and, but, and also just kind of want to it and kind of a feel-good story. Like, everything right. wraps yeah. up well. Yeah. Which, in reality, doesn't. <laughs> I kind of, like, really... Like, in retrospect, I really started rolling my eyes during... Or, like, when I started reading about, like, what the true story of this was, I really started, like, rolling my eyes w- remembering that scene where they kind of, like, set up a sting operation on the one racist Oh, cop. yeah. I was just kind of like... Ugh. That's, like, the most unrealistic, weird scene... That's yeah, they're just all like, like high fiving, and, yeah. like, and like the chief is it's there, kinda, and he's like, "You're fired. <laughs> We're gonna arrest the one racist cop. We're gonna arrest the one <laughs> racist cop." It's like Jesus. It's something that doesn't even happen yeah, today, much yeah. less in 1970. No, yeah. in, to in, benefit in, the one African American cop on yeah, the force. You're under arrest. This is a social situation in a bar where you, it's just like, See, like it's the, fucking the, weird. It's stuck yeah, it's between like, stuff because like I did like the scene when they're like uh, putting the mic on someone and like. Um, Ron Stallworth is talking to the flip character and he's kind of right. like, do you know who the cop was? You know, when my girlfriend, whatever her name is, got pulled over. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, he's like, we, we know he's a bad apple or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he's like, but are do, you going to be, do you want to be yeah. the guy that calls him out? Like that's, that's some hard hitting real shit right there. Yeah, right? They're like, I we protect our own or whatever they say. Yeah. At the end of the movie. Oh like, yeah. We're a family. I would have liked, that's some I would have liked more yeah. a relationship between, Ron Stallworth in the flip character like Mm -hmm. you know and I know they made up the part about him being Jewish but it's not a horrible addition to this movie because I I think it's it's nice to sort of point that out that like it isn't just like a a total color of your skin thing with the Ku Klux Klan it's Mm -hmm. this weird superiority complex and they're drawing from ideals from you know Mm -hmm. um, Germany and Europe and stuff like that and like they had I did like the one scene with flip sort of like talking to ron where he's like you know I, I wasn't really thinking about it until we did this project and now i can't stop thinking about like you know do His i heritage right my, yeah. do i identify with this and what is my heritage and stuff like that and it was like a nice sort of quiet moment and that we didn't really get any follow-up on that you know like i wanted some sort of end to that storyline of him you know choosing to identify and being passing and what like whatnot. no yeah and the, yeah like like you were saying before and then jordan kind of piled on and i, I want to pile on top of that too is that like do you want to be the guy who kind of whatever it like this is family and i think that like cracks into some like real kind of like blue lives matter kind of shit it's kind of like you know like we're all putting our like lives on, like was, our lives on the line i was kind of waiting for okay. they did the one scene where they're like panning across all their faces as they're pulling the hoods off and David Duke's being like, remove your hood as he like goes to water. I was waiting for someone to remove their hood and it to be that fucking cop. And then the whole operation to be blown up because it was like someone at the force was like, Oh no, no, we can't fuck over our cop. The whole operation's done. Cause I didn't know how the actual story ended. Mm-hmm. Obviously Spike Lee didn't either <laughs> with this shit, but like, I don't know. I felt like that was like, a, like that would have been a better resolution to that cop storyline. Like, Rather right. than like, oh, we got him for just being an asshole. Yeah. Like, have him be an actual part of the Ku Klux Klan and then they, they can't finish the mission. Or, yeah. And the message is, you know, like, it, it's a complicated issue. Like, 
you know, you may have cops who want to do the right thing, but what do they put first? Like the equal rights of, you know, their colleagues or the people who share the same skin color as them. Right. And that's, I, I don't know. It, it's, it, it's really not far off from the truth either. And that's why like the love interest or like the civil rights, uh, like chapter, or I, I don't know what exactly the organization that she's a part of. Um, that's why she's like, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, like, um, you know, the police were involved or just like a part like if some officers on their own time are a part of the Ku Klux Klan or whatever, mm-hmm. and yeah, I was kind of expecting something like yeah, that so too, was I. because that is something that has actually happened in history. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just it's crazy the fucking opportunities that Spike Lee is given to make a very again the fucking truth is terrible and it's hard hitting we have a really bad history of racism and like terrible things that happen in this country it's just it's crazy to me that he picked this event uh that i that can be like picked apart with such like documented history and uh kind of the, the, the truth about racism in America is already, like, stranger than right. fiction. Yeah, we yeah. don't need it, to it's, fictionalize this. Right. It's That's why Detroit that's, bugged me so much, too, is, like, that story is already crazy enough. We didn't need to have them be these, like, bloodthirsty villains. Like, it's, well, it's, just it's, the, ab, the, the treatment of people like that without, like, these crazy notions behind it is the, disgusting enough. The most hard-hitting thing is when you show kind of... Um, birth of a nation when you show um what was the movie in the beginning gone with, gone the, with the, wind. the wind gone with the wind when you show kind of this like alec baldwin when you show the last five minutes of the film with um what is the town called charlottesville charlottesville, the charlottesville. higher murder yeah the Char- charlottesville like tiki torches and everything and it's kind of like yes that's all happening in our actual reality but the story didn't happen in our reality it, it's it's kind of like almost like it it makes this movie work less you know it's it's this movie is happening in a reality that's not ours mm-hmm. and i think that's what like really hurts the movie i don't know i i think there's something i don't know it's weird um but yeah i can read a little bit of i picked out some clips of the boots riley letter to spike lee um if you guys would like to hear that at this part of this the podcast. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, okay. Uh, when, white supremac- when white supremacist organizations were infiltrated by the FBI and the cops, it was not to disrupt it was not to disrupt them. They weren't dis- disrupted. It was to use them to threaten and or physically attack radical organizations. There was no directive to stop the rise of the white supremacist organizations. Uh, Riley also accused the real stalwart of aiding the orchestration of terrorist attacks on African-American communities during the civil rights movement, including the church bombings of Bir- uh, Birmingham, Alabama, the assassination of a civil rights organizer from Detroit, and the Greensboro massacre of communist worker party members in 1979. He's accusing Stallworth of that? Yes, because his... Wasn't he- Birmingham before 1978? Um... I don't know. I thought it was in the 60s. Yeah, look it up. Um, But, um, yeah. And then kind of right after that, he talks about, yeah, going into like... Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know then. Um, Well, I mean, again, just to kind of cover our own asses, we're coming off of this with a... This from is, a letter from a separate are, director. Yeah, I, I just yeah <coughs> I mean, for for the for the yeah for the record, I want to say that this is like what Brutes Riley has written in a letter, a public letter to Spike Lee. You can look it up for yourself. And, and I, I I haven't done much research, and I just want to say that again, I don't completely agree with this because again, Riley references reports that Lee received two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, again, NY- like, I don't know this is fact. That's partially why right. I really didn't necessarily want to bring it up. I just thought it was right. kind of important to no, discussion yeah. at that point. That Lee received two hundred thousand dollars from the NYPD to help in an ad campaign that was aired at aiming at improving relations with minority communities. 
uh, whether it actually or is not uh, Black Klansman feels like an extension of that ad campaign. <clears throat> Do I find it, you know, and okay, this is me now. I find it hard to believe that Spike Lee like woke up one day and was like, you know, I want to, you know, promote like the all lives matter or like yeah, blue lives sure. matter like agenda. I think it's more so it, it's just like kind of in bad taste to like make this movie when you have that kind of like public. You know, mm -hmm. you've publicly accepted this kind of thing. Um, I don't know, and then make a film. I, like I this. do think I do think Spike Lee's heart is in the right place. Oh yeah, um, no, for especially sure. just hearing because Always. again, like like I was saying, the director's cut podcast. I came mm -hmm. to it like, hoping to hear some behind the scenes of the making of this movie, and he kind of just like preached for like you know forty five minutes in the whole episode, and so clearly he's got a lot of feelings and opinions. And you know ideas that he's trying to get across uh, about these topics. So I don't I don't think it's for lack of you know. Right. And uh, I I don't want to like create any grand conspiracy that like Spike Lee <laughs> is like you know against African Americans. You, you know you know no, or, or something. It, and he's built a, he's built an entire career obviously saying the opposite or whatever. I think maybe this film both in a narrative and a political uh, place was maybe a misstep, you know? Like, I think maybe, I, I don't know. Yeah, his heart was definitely in the right place, but, like, I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't do a lot of fact-checking on this memoir or something, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how this, this happens. The one thing I wish we had knowledge of right now is is uh -huh. the memoir creating those fake facts and, right, and exactly. the script is right yeah. off of mm -hmm. that, or are was the memoir the truth and spike lee was like oh, but if we're gonna make a movie we gotta make it interesting right. i exactly. do know that he, he gave john david washington the book before he gave him the script he was still writing the script um i don't know if that tells us anything about the veracity of the the memoir also i don't i think it, i i told jordan outside when we we uh we stepped outside like right before this podcast and we were talking about it again just this episode of off the mic <laughs> <laughs> because i again i think we're both just so weirded out about talking about racial issues i felt weird after talking about black panther where you know i kind of listened to other kind of uh you know just kind of like black reviews of that movie who disagreed with that and me disagreeing with them like that's weird you know, kind of, and I think I'm doing, like, a lot of the same thing with that. But we went outside, and Jordan was like, I don't know how to feel about, like, a lot of this being false or whatever. And, uh, or how that affects, kind of, the score of the movie. And I said, like, you know, like, how much of the social network actually really happened? That's all completely fabricated and fictional, kind of. And they're just kind of using these plot points to, to guide the movie. You know, like these characters all existed. Did, did any of those conversations really happen? But, but then, it, be, it would be like then, if the social network was like, oh, like, like if Mark Zuckerberg didn't actually invent Facebook and they right. made that the case in the movie. But again, it yeah. And the point that I that I made was just kind of like it made for a fantastic movie that Aaron Sorkin wrote and Fade David Fincher like directed. It's kind of like. Spike Lee changing the events of what actually happened, I think just made this a little more muddled mm -hmm. and like kind of, I don't know, it gave him some sort of misdirection. I, I don't know. It made it, it made it a worse movie. Like if he used actual events, like we said before, like it, it kind of would, it would have served his purpose a little more. But I think by, yeah, we've been hammering this nail the entire episode. But yes. Sorry, I was looking up some. I was fact checking some stuff. Go for it. <clears throat> but know. you know, like that's that was my point. Is just, I mean, when it gets into like, I don't know. Yeah, we've really like mainly only talked like broad terms about this movie. I don't really know how to jump in specifically. We're we're kind of towards the end of this episode as well. Um, right. I guess the only thing I can say is that like I didn't know about this whole stuff being like false until today right so watching the movie and coming out of the movie i mainly my complaints were with the editing like i thought the editing didn't serve the movie at all 
um, we've alluded to, we haven't really talked to it about how the movie closes on footage from the, the Charlottesville rally Mm -hmm. and the Tiki torches. And it's got like Donald Trump's response in it. And it's got the footage of the Mustang hitting Heather higher and all the other protesters there. And it's, it's weird. It, that's where I start to feel like maybe you wanted to make a documentary and you couldn't like kill that darling to just make a fictional movie. Yeah, I was telling you. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like too on the nose because it's like I, I got a lot of the feelings. You know, like there's there's stuff that they're saying without even having to go as far as like that we need to make or bring America back to the... Like he, he has some line that's trying to be like sisterly to the, the Make America Great Again right. slogan. Yeah. Um, like the, there's enough comparison to like modern day Nazism, um, you know, just in the stuff that's going on there and... We didn't need to be like, oh, and it's happening today, you know. <laughs> like we, we got it, and it, and if you wanted to make that point, then make a documentary about this, you know, and then then you can actually tell the truth about this story. Yeah, I think the last five minutes of this movie are both uh, incredibly powerful, uh, but it also kind of feels like Spike Lee is kind of goosing everything that mm-hmm. came before this point. Uh, and I feel like it's a little manipulative. Um, it feels it's like it feels like, it feels like less artistic and more visceral. Did you watch Thirteenth? Yes. It's basically what happens in Thirteenth. Yeah. But Thirteenth is a documentary talking about the mm-hmm. history of racism and how sort of there's like a new form of slavery in America yes. through the um, private practice like uh, prison system going mm-hmm. on, and um, you know basically all the policies that allowed that to continue. And then towards the end of the film, it talks about like uh, Donald Trump and shows like some modern clips of like Donald Trump. It's really effective in that movie because they're not really beating you over the head with it. They present you with the information. That works totally for me. Yeah. And then they show Donald Trump and they don't even say anything. They're just kind of like, Mm -hmm. how do you think this relates to this? You know, know, let your mind wander into how this might be related. Whereas this, like it's jarring to go from fiction to real life. And it, it just makes it, it takes you out of the experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know the movie's over at that point, and it smothers your discernment. I yeah. think, and I, don't, I like it, it, it's it's like like one step worse than like we've been complaining on this podcast so long about like true story movies that end with like, like to- footage of the yeah. real characters, mm-hmm. totally or yeah. like, uh, the, and this is like that yeah. except it's showing like I the real Tanya. David Duke, and, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's 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 not very effective for me, or I guess I guess it's effective for what Spike Lee wants to accomplish in terms of getting a message across. It's not effective in terms of filmmaking for me. Yeah, is the point I should make, I guess. Yeah, like he, yeah. he's like in the podcast, he does talk about like you know like you can hear like a pin drop when that scene plays. And that's right. Everyone is completely silent when that plays out of respect for this like awful sort of chapter in our history that's sort of still ongoing and still being written right um Who that doesn't be? make it a good end to the movie no yeah i don't know like i again, but, to kind of play devil's advocate i feel like it's a better end to the movie than the actual ending of the movie because right. the actual ending of the movie is kind of like hey everything's resolved everyone's a big happy family now mm. but this is like no this shit is still going on and it still needs to be addressed like you know drastically Mm -hmm. so i kind of feel like it conflicts with the ending of the movie which makes it a better ending to the movie because you're like oh man that story might have been a happy ending but this shit is still going on Mm -hmm. it it, it it serves his message but is that is that good filmmaking like if you take like the moral message out of it and you had like a movie that like ended on a happy note and then we show some real life footage to like kind of bum you out like Maybe and it's I like mean, weird different aspect ratios and it's it, it looks who, different and I mean that, like is that like, good is that good filmmaking? It plays like a it YouTube might, video. It depends. On, like, I mean like stri- I don't yeah, know, it's, it's like weird. cell phone footage. Yeah. And... Cuz I mean like it's it's kind of the same as like a documentary film in a way like with mixed media and everything like this might have been a fictional narrative documentary kind of like some weird new genre mixed media mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, like, I don't know. I'm kind of throwing words together to make it sound okay. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it didn't... feels like it feels like a non-traditional movie in that sense. So, to me, it does kind of help the story. 
Maybe not in like a textbook filmmaking kind of way. It dates the movie like a motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does <laughs> for sure. I think the part I also really didn't like, not because of the meaning of it, but just the actual visual of, because like the the cell phone footage and all the like whatever YouTube footage, they do enough a, a good enough job of zooming in so that it fills the full frame mm-hmm. of the movie. Yep. But then after that, it cuts like the movie. The, the I think the last image we see is an upside down flag yeah. and then it fades to like black and white but it's like letterboxed on the side so like we're seeing the black bars on the side of it because the flag is not in 169 or whatever and that's just like was that important that's the part where I'm talking about when I say it feels like a college powerpoint presentation it does, like it's yeah. like people who are just putting like picture like I, I can show you like movies I made in high school that were like oh I didn't care to like zoom in on the picture to make the right. you know aspect ratio correct so there's just mm-hmm. weird letterbox yeah that's the side. true like the, the small things that could have easily been corrected with a little bit of editing or like is that upside down flag important enough or and if it is film a flag and put it upside down and do it in 69 like do we need this like it's not even like they took like a like a, a like they made someone graphic design it they just took like clip art essentially of a flag just the most basic like absolutely perfect straight lines and flipped it upside down like like oh i was, don't know was that relevant to Style, 1978 like, like it was just it's kind of a little like weird like yeah i mean even flag. if you even if you want to insert that to get your message across mm-hmm. just from an aesthetic standpoint like film it like you film the alec uh, Baldwin part you know mm-hmm. like make it gritty and stylized and cool looking rather than just like oh pfft, here's this flag with black bars on the side you know and right. then and then when you look at it through the like sort of inserting this message into like a fictional film like kind of ham fisting it in there then it's even worse like I, hate, I hated the ending to this movie yeah like I, I was moved because I'm like, oh, that was a really shitty time, and it's still kind of ongoing and unresolved. And like, I get the point, Spike Lee, but like, I think you made a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's what the core of uh, pretty much everything that's been said is that it's just I don't know, it's just a, it's an awkward experience because I think it has really great intentions, and it turns out being. A not great movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so confused about how to rate this movie. <laughs> Again, I, I I didn't know anything about the the, the fictionalization of this movie until you guys brought that up in this. I mean, again, to our while I, recording, I, I, I got, we don't. I we was, don't necessarily. So like, I was coming to this review like, oh man, I kind of had fun. I just didn't like some of the editing. I and I, stuff I had and, like a few beers last night, and uh, I finally read the Boots Riley review. Uh, because Boots Riley it was was kind of considerate enough to be like in his tweet be like, "Hey, this has like a ton of spoilers. Mm-hmm. It spoils the end in the entire third act. Like, don't read this if you're gonna go see Black Klansman." And, and I knew I was gonna go see it, so then I didn't read it until last night. And a few beers on me, like I was telling Jordan, I was and then like, I read it after he told me. <laughs> and I was like, I was like fucking riled up last night. I was like, "Your boots Riley'd up." Last yeah, night. <laughs> I was like, "What the fuck?" And this morning I woke up. And I was kind of like, I, uh, I don't know. And it's like, again, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm still in a place of being like a little torn about this movie. Mm-hmm. Again, because I had fun. I think everybody in this movie is pretty fun. Uh, you know, Adam Driver does like a good job. I think he's just kind of playing Adam Driver, though. Uh, I mean, Lara Harrier or what, whatever her name is. Mm-hmm. That's her. Um, I fucking love her in this. I she's not given enough to do. She's severely underwritten, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. She's like really great in this film. Uh, Topher Grace <laughs> is like a really good. Um, what's his name? Uh, David Duke. David Duke, um, and plays just like a real, like, dickhead, but like subtly dickhead running for office yeah right like subtly and Paula like he's kind of has that politician tinge and it's like he kind of even looks like a younger David Duke and everything uh just a really solid performance by Topher Grace um yeah I don't know it's it's just it's a weird movie man I mean it's hard to like figure out how to rate it because you're like do we take all this new information into account or do we just kind of think about it the movie self-contained like that's where i'm torn yeah 
Let me read the Rotten Tomatoes while you guys mull over that <laughs> so we can get yeah. out of here. Uh, on review aggregation website Rotten Tomatoes, the film has an approval rating of 95% based on 281 reviews with an average rating of 8.2 out of 10. The website's critical consensus reads, Black Klansman uses history to offer bitingly trenchant commentary on current events and brings out some of Spike Lee's hardest-hitting work in decades along the way. Side note, before we get into our ratings, um, I'm a little confused uh, while we're talking about the ending of the movie. Okay. You know, when they do like the Spike Lee dolly shot? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then they cut to the bar? Mm-hmm. What is supposed to be implied there? Because like they hear the knock at the door, they grab the guns, they do the dolly shot down the hall, and then they're just at the bar. Is is it implied that that guy that they're doing the sting operation for was bothering them at the door, or was that? Well, because at the that end was they, supposed to be the KKK. Well, it was because at the end they go to the end and they see the cross burning. So it's kind of like the. The, it's their, kind of, that local chapter is still, it's still doing there. shit, it's, it, and now they know who he it's, is. Yeah, it, it's definitely a more of an abstract duty calls kind of thing, where it's <clears> kind <throat> of like the two of us can continue fighting um, oppression. Yeah, it's like uh, our job isn't over through, yet. We stopped this bombing, yeah, th- but... Through me and my, my you know, th- through their different kind of vessels. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, no, from, does, from the inside but that, and the outside. But that outside. sort of like goes again, like the scene that have a, that they're in the middle of an argument about I can't sleep with you because you work for the police, and they haven't resolved it. They just hear a knock at the door, and then they're just partners. I now. guess that's their resolution is that they're both working toward the same thing. I'm. It's I, sort of like I can't tell you anymore. <laughs> it's, it's it's missing yeah, a line. No, it's missing it's, a line of uh-huh, resolution yeah, too. It it's, is, it's, uh-huh. For sure, it, it comes across as like Deus Ex Machina, mm-hmm. sort of. Um, Anyway, I just, I had that. That's true. I completely forgot about that scene. Because, <laughs> yeah, they have, like, the dolly shot. And I was like, oh, this is important. And then they're right. just like, all right, now we're going to go to the it's, cross. You, yeah, again. it is. Like, they're discussing their future together. And, uh, yeah, I think it's almost like they can't be petty about details of whatever. It's kind of like they're still this burning fucking cross. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, who would like to venture first into rating this movie? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. If you, I'll go. If you want, go for it. Okay. Um, I'm torn between two numbers. I've said everything I pretty much needed to say, um, but, or at least that I've had written down. But I mean. Um, Again, I had high expectations for this film without really... T- I, again, I'm like not super familiar with Spike Lee, um, especially over the past decade. I've seen Inside Man, I've seen the military movie that he's done, and maybe like a few more over the past decade, but I think they've all been not great films. Um, I still think... I still like respect his vision. I still get excited about stuff. I... I'm not going to lie, I was not excited about this trailer. I was just kind of like, okay, you know, like, oh, I'll see it, and, like, maybe this movie will convince me otherwise kind of thing. I didn't think it was a greatly cut trailer. I just thought the the concept, like, once I understood what the trailer was trying to tell me, I was right. like, oh, that could be a cool movie. And it's Spike Lee, and it's produced by Jordan Peele. All right, I'll go see it. Yeah. I'm, and Adam Driver. <laughs> I feel like... A lot of the posters and trailers had a like Jordan Peele's name gigantic and mm-hmm. Spike Lee's name very small. Jordan Peele, um, that was one of the the little tidbits that came out of that podcast that mm-hmm. Jordan Peele was the first on board. Like, good, it was his movie, and he asked Spike Lee to direct it, and that's oh, how okay, he got good. involved. Um, there was another thing. Uh, now that I think about it, um, there's a thought where. There's a bunch of scenes of, like, Adam Driver kind of being like, yeah, I'm glad you're getting your kick out of this, but I, like, kind of, I don't know where I stand with this. And he'll kind of, like, put the card, you know, like, the KKK Klansman card, kind of, like, he'll put, like, a pin in it and then, like, walk away. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, next scene, like, he's infiltrating like that. It, it's, it's just kind of like he shows doubt 
but then it'll just like cut to a scene where like he's like infiltrating like the kkk again yeah i thought they needed a scene they're, they're, to close up that because they do have the the sort of through line of of uh ron stallworth trying to be like you know like because they have the one scene where he's like you know that's the thing like you know this is you know important to you but this is just a job for me mm-hmm. and then they have this scene where ron stallworth is like you know like you're jewish like you have as much of a dog in this fight as i do mm-hmm. and then they also have the scene of him being like oh i've been like thinking about my heritage lately and mm-hmm. then they don't like follow that up with like has he decided to be like fully into this you know like i i think they needed they, a scene where well, they, 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 they he went above and beyond yeah. he had a choice to just treat it like a job and he was like no fuck it like i'm going all well in. They, I they, think they kind have, of do that because... they literally have two or three scenes where adam driver walks away from him like mid-conversation being like i do i gotta stop like i'm gonna fucking die here you know mm. like i can't keep risking this and then like it'll just cut to the next scene and again, he'll be like right back into the character. Like I just, I kind of didn't understand that. I was well, like there's a scene where he's like, when he he's getting inducted, I guess, mm-hmm. and David Duke character is like, you know, say you're you're not a Jewish American or whatever. He's like, I'm not, and then he struggles to actually say it. So like, I think for like that scene, he makes it makes me think like he's actually accepted that like his identity and then his stake in the game at this point because he struggles to say that because otherwise he would have said it right away to be like way more convincing Mm -hmm. so that scene him like struggling to say that convinced me of like he's decides to be like this is more than a job to me now it's just weird um besides that i it's also weird that he has a star of david around his neck but he's not practicing (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's never. I haven't been, thought about it much, I've much about my heritage, but I wear this yes. symbol I around mean, my neck. I mean, I mean don't it's weirder when you think about the fact that they fabricated his Jewish heritage. Mm-hmm. I mean, but don't too. a lot of like Christians wear crosses and they're not necessarily practicing? Well, I. But because it's part of the culture, because like, right. they were raised in like a Catholic family and like went yeah, to that's like true. if he hasn't been practicing, that's the part that's like you can be practicing like but not like in his devout life, or believing, right? yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he was part of like the you know he's he's like I didn't have a, a bat mitzvah like right yeah, yeah yeah if you did that I don't think you're wearing a like, like it's star it, of David when you're when you look at the fact that the movie in the- fictionalized mm-hmm. his Jewish heritage then it becomes obvious and you see the writer's fingerprints of he's wearing a star of David so that the Ron Stallworth character would be like oh you are Jewish yeah, <laughs> yeah right yeah true uh-huh. <clears throat> um, besides that um, I think maybe. Uh, my last thought is that I, I think I am just, you know, again, I'm not super familiar with Spike Lee. I think uh, I, I was t- telling Jordan this earlier, but I've like, uh, Sorry to Bother You is the film that I've been like championing <laughs> this year. Just like Good Time I was championing last year. Um, and it's just, I, I love the film so much and it touched me and it's it's just kind of like, I can understand why Boots Riley like really lashed out at this movie because there's so many elements of this movie kind of like changing your voice to like a white voice on the phone mm-hmm. and like which is a big part of like sorry to bother you and um, and also like even the kind of uh, girlfriend like love interest situation is very 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 similar. Um, like when you were saying like, you know, like, I don't know if I can ride with you or whatever. There's a similar scene in sort of bother you and, um, oh God, it's, it's such, it's so poignant. It's like one of the, one of the best things I've seen in cinema like this year. And, you know, he's kind of worked his way up through telemarketing to like this really great job and he's making tons of money. And of course, like his girlfriend who is kind of like a part of, She's, she does like art exhibit stuff. She's like a revolutionary, like Banksy kind of person. She's a part of the revolution. She's sort of like, um, she's also a part of like this, like create a union organization in the place where he's working kind of. And it's come to this like place where she is enjoying living in like his really nice apartment where he didn't have a fucking like pot to piss in before. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I don't know. I literally think she says like, I don't know if I can ride with you anymore. Mm-hmm. Kind of. And he's like, 
and he has like this like dial like this monologue it's it, part of it's even in the trailer and he's like he's like god damn it he's like if for like once in my life i found something that i'm good at and i don't know why i have to like sacrifice that because of like the condition under like that i was born in to like risk everything that i have right now he's kind of like you know like 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 i finally got to the place i've been going like my whole life i've, I've lived my entire life like fucking poverty stricken you know like there, there's a scene in like the trailer where he's like he goes to a gas station and he's like 40 on regular and then he like puts down 40 cents like it's just like it's bad and, mm-hmm. it, and it says so much about capitalism and everything and it's just like it is this kind of like ooh, it's just kind of like man like why do i have to say something just because i'm like black mm-hmm. like uh, i don't know or stand up i don't know that's such like that gives me chills every time i think about that scene um but anyway, yeah, this movie, I, I don't know. It didn't touch me in any way. It complicated a lot of feelings that I have about this movie. Uh, it, it just continued to complicate things. I mean, again, as I was watching this movie unfold, after I watched this movie, details that kind of came out. Um, I don't think it's a good movie, and I also think it kind of muddles what it stands for, and I think it also the more you look up about it the more complicated you feel about it so i when i first when i before i knew anything i think i was going to give it a two and a half or a three uh but i have kind of leaned back to it too so i think i'm gonna give it a two okay that's <laughs> <laughs> well no i wasn't wow, sure if of, i should jump in over that, that. <laughs> i don't know um, and again like I, it's one of those weird things where i don't like it doesn't feel like my fucking place to like voice my opinion about some of this shit but like oh, yeah no that's it's, the hard part. And, and it's really weird and uh well i don't it's it's not race related to say that it's not a good movie. Like, is there's problems just in the actual filmmaking of it, and then when you fictionalize stuff and call it a true story, like, right, that's objectively like not a cool thing to do. Right, it's no. misleading and it's deceptive, and it's it's probably morally wrong, and it also ends up hurting the movie. Yes. Anyway, Jordan. Okay. I mean, I was kind of. Well, you sounded same. like you were ready to go. Oh, I was. I wasn't. I was in the same boat where I was with Joe between like a two and a half and a three. But I still think I'm going to stick with a two and a half just because I just as the movie itself, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I thought it, <clears throat> I thought it was well done and I liked the kind of rougher style and the editing and the mixed media kind of feel. I enjoyed it. The, you like the like three high fives happening in a row. Like. <laughs> well, it's kind of. It's, the thing is, like, he has his own specific style, just like Tarantino has his own style. Right, yes. uh-huh. And, like, I appreciate that. I appreciate... I love the Spike the Lee in- flourishes, yes. Uh-huh. I appreciate the indiv- individuality of it. So, like, the posters coming up on the screen or, like, the 16 millimeter film or 8 millimeter, whatever the hell it was in the beginning. Like, I enjoyed that stuff. It's, like, it's nice to me to see this and then maybe see, like, a David Fincher film that's, like aesthetically perfect mm-hmm. right. so and consistent and... yeah so i i like that because it's it's a different kind of filmmaking and i like how that's still thriving in a world of perfection in filmmaking mm-hmm. so from a filmmaking standpoint i enjoyed it for that but the movie to me wasn't spectacular i thought it was good i enjoyed it i didn't think it was bad at all the new facts that we found out if they're true or not still don't know for sure but as it stands now to me hurt the score a little bit because it does feel a little you know false and a little disingenuine and all of that so i'm still going to stick with the 2.5 a little bit more than joe because i probably still enjoyed the film itself more Mm -hmm. than joe did Mm -hmm. so yeah 2.5 yeah i think before these facts i was stuck between like a two and a half and a three where like if, if, it's pretty much it's, yeah, that's like the, us, what yeah. we've all said yeah yeah like it's like, I, it's I like it, it, it's it like not a good movie to begin with kind of it, thing. It, yeah. it wasn't perfect i did enjoy it like i i right. you know i wasn't bored watching it i was invested in this storyline and i think like when you like i didn't like the editing so like that knocks it down a few pegs but if you take like that bad editing out of it like it's an interesting storyline it's for the most part well acted 
Um, it's it's sort of funny at times, and then you know interesting at other times when it needs to be, and you know the drama is definitely there, and the stakes are there. Um, but then like this new information about it being somewhat manufactured definitely knocks it down a few more pegs. Where and it also like makes me less forgiving of those sort of editing um it starts to choices those bold choices where thing, i'm like right. uh, i'm less forgiving of that weird editing stuff because like then the stuff in the middle starts to look less good too you know because like mm-hmm. if i took that editing stuff out it was maybe like a three and a half or a four like i think it, it, it's it's well made mm-hmm. right? in terms of technically speaking it's a well shot movie there's a lot of cool techniques that i like in the middle of it right um you know and i think there's just a lot of like good classic filmmaking in there um, and it maybe needed just a little bit more work on the script and, you know, punched up a little bit, you know, here and there in just terms of making it a little bit more exciting. But when you look at the fact that it is sort of fictionalized like that, that I'm definitely going to look a little bit harder at the editing stuff and maybe not be as forgiving about that. And yeah, so I think I'm going to land on it too. It's, I think that sort of pushes it to a below average movie where like before mm-hmm. I'm like, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. You know, there's some things I definitely would have changed. There's some things that I definitely thought were memorable about the movie. Um, But it it definitely, it recontextualizes the whole movie to be like, oh, (laughs) this isn't a true story. And you were bending truth in a way that didn't necessarily serve the story better. Um, And I can't really always condone that. So I'm going to give it two fingers. That's going to come to 2.16 repeating for the podcast. We'll round that down to two fingers as a whole, officially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a less than average movie for Spike here. Did we ever do the like comments on the? Did we have any Facebook? You know what? I I went back and I I, I picked up uh, again on the how many fingers am I holding up Facebook group? Uh, join it today. We're discussing movies. Um, yeah, I mean like. E- on it wasn't on the poster or whatever, but um, uh, Christine Murawski, a previous guest, said uh, th- this is kind of a chain. It said saw Black Klansman over the weekend. I thought it was great. It was full of dark humor, heavy topics, and an uncomfortable feeling that sticks with you in a good way. Anyone else see this yet? And then Fatima, 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 forgive me. Uh, Ahmad said, I had a different feeling about it, dot, dot, dot. I really wanted to like it, but with the final montage, I felt like it was hitting you over the head with a modern-day connection when they were already pretty clear. And then Christine responded, I feel like I'm nixing the final montage when I talk about the movie. I'm still unsure if I feel like it fit slash was necessary, but then again, I enjoyed something like that being brought to a movie screen, mixed feelings. And then um, Fatima responded, uh, my other thoughts about this film might include more of a political one, but I disliked how the arc of Patrice ended and how little the movie engaged with her views, dot, 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 particularly on police abolishment. I think if you came into this movie unaware of that idea, you really uh, would come out not knowing much about it. Um, uh, or at least, uh, or at the very least, really understanding why these groups aren't just talking to Ron's position, or why aren't just taking Ron's position and advocating for more black cops. Overall, I think this review on Letterboxd is where I came down on this film. Uh, sorry, I just butchered your fucking comment. Uh, but she left a link to a two and a half star review on Letterboxd by Demi. Oh man, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Where's that like pronouncing software from like two episodes <laughs> yes. ago? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, uh, but he's great. Uh, Demi. Uh, oh, no, I don't. I don't even want to try it. He's he's really great. He used to be on Vine. I think he's written for a lot of television shows. He has a podcast now. I don't remember what it's called, but I've listened to it. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was like a really great conversation that's happening on the group. And definitely uh, speak for it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, I... Fatima, Fatima. God damn it. I wish I knew how to fucking. Uh, you know, 
I, I, I really like like a lot of the stuff she's saying on the group, and I think she's like Riley's friends. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are ever in the area. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely come on an Road episode. Road trip to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I love both of your takes in the Facebook group. <laughs> oh my god, we should have. No, <laughs> we should have a contest. <laughs> Mike, I know Mike already hates this idea where our like listeners all like submit something and we pick somebody to like have a Skype like guest who because they they don't live around here or whatever. Yeah. Uh, to be a just exper- an experimental episode where they come on <laughs> as a Skype guest and uh, I don't know. Come on, I want to have Alexander from SoundCloud on this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to him over Skype. Well, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, it's a funny idea. Like Alexander, if you agree or disagree, you can leave a comment below on YouTube, SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you're finding out about this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And as Joe was saying before, the most efficient way to... to uh, continue the conversation is on our Facebook group. How many fingers am I holding up the Facebook group? We've got posts for all the movies we're reviewing and you can start a conversation about movies. We may not be reviewing as well and solicit our opinions about those and right. the uh, members of the group as well. So definitely join Go us. See, there. Thank you for <laughs> see what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Say so go see the better movie. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were gonna say thank you for bothering me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for bothering me. <laughs> thank you for bothering me with your movie opinions <laughs> on my group. I don't want anyone joining. Uh, yeah, and once again, check out Jordan shit at jordanweinrich.com or redtorchvisuals.com. Yeah. Yep, mm-hmm. either one. Check out As, both of them. Hopefully. Um, and check out all of our stuff at how many fingers podcast.com. And that'll about do it for us. We're going to go get some food. I hope. Mayhap. We got time. We'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And we'll see you guys next week for, I'm not sure, but we'll let you know in the intro probably. We will. Goodbye. Later.